Hello, everybody. I do believe we are live. Hello, hello. Hi, Tim from Australia. We are starting now. So we are going to be playing an interview that we did with Carl from Second uh, from Single Store DB. He had to uh, pre-record this interview with us um, because uh, the interviewer Ramon is in a very different time zone than Carl, um, and so we will be kicking things off by playing the recording of the interview. I suggest that everybody put their questions in the YouTube chat uh, because I will be saving them to ask Carl live after the recording is over. Uh, we'll have a live q and I'll bring him on uh, at the end so that we can chat a little bit and, um, and we can get all of your questions answered. So um, I'm going to wait just another minute to let a couple more folks filter in. Um, you're welcome to ask questions in the YouTube chat. You can also uh, go to the Wasm NA channel in the WebAssembly Discord. Uh, I will check in there as well for any questions that you might have. So um, yeah, definitely ask questions as you have them throughout the interview and we will get to them at the very end. So thank you everybody who joins and we can get rolling with this interview. So I will get out of the way and you can all enjoy Carl and Ramon talking about WebAssembly at the database layer. Enjoy. All right, we are recording. Hello, everybody. Um, it is such a joy to be able to have this interview pre-recorded for you at Wasm Day, at uh, Wasm NA. Uh, sadly, uh, I am in the Central European time zone, so this interview could only be recorded in advance. But it is my extreme joy to be able to present to you Carl Sever from Single Store. So, welcome, Carl. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'd love to ask: Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, please? Ah, thank, thanks, Ramon. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, I also won't be able to attend the meetup live due to <laughs> scheduling, but one day we will both, uh, both hopefully, uh, yeah, see it live. <laughs> That'd be nice. Um, That'd be amazing. But yeah, uh, my name is Carl, as Ramon said, and I've been working at Single Store, which is a database company, for the last decade. Um, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's as long as my career. <laughs> It's been a little while, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I've just been working on everything and anything databases, uh, whether it's database engine or, you know, the tooling that goes around databases that make it sort of usable. Um, I've done a lot of experience uh, in front end as well. Um, so I've built a lot of the sort of visualization tools that go on top of databases. Um, and one thing I've learned through my decade at Single Store is the power of leveraging the database to improve the application. Um, and that's something we're going to touch on today with a discussion on WebAssembly and how WebAssembly can make databases better and potentially WebAssembly and databases can make your application better. That's super cool. Um, I'd love to know, Carl, how, was it through Single Store that you discovered this passion for, for databases or did that come from before? That's a really good question. Um, before Single Store, I worked at a company called Mixpanel. Mixpanel is like a yeah. junior analytics company that you might be aware of, uh, similar to like Google Analytics. Um, and at Mixpanel, I worked on the front end team. So all of the visualizations, like funnel analytics, segmentation, all that type of stuff, that was what I got to build, which was really fun. Uh, and through that, I got to sort of see the development because Mixpanel actually built their own database from scratch. Um, and so I got to see this like thing being cool. built to support the visualizations that I need. So it was a very purpose-built database. Like if I needed a specific type of query operation, the database team would actually go and build that specific thing that I needed. So that was really cool. And I could see how like this, uh, you know, algorithm X in the database would just directly impact the performance of the thing I was trying to build. So that was really illuminating. And then when I got the opportunity to work at single store, I saw that as being sort of a level up from that because it allowed me 
in Mixpanel, the database was built only for Mixpanel. With single store, the database was being built for the world. So it allowed me to basically build the thing that allows other people to experience that same thing that I felt because single source is like a more of a general purpose database. Um, so that was sort of, I guess, where the passion came from. That's really cool. Thank you. Uh, I love, and I love that that sort of passion turned into let's bring this joy to everyone else. So tell us a little bit about uh, single store, please. What, what is it that makes it unique? So single store is a distributed relational database. So if you're familiar with databases, stores data for your application. Relational means that it's it's sort of uh, built around relational sets or relational algebra. Uh, so effectively, you have things called tables, which contain your rows. Um, and you you know one really key aspect of relational databases is that they're really efficient at joining data together. So you have like table A, table B, and you you basically look at rows from both sides of that join. Um, and so single store was built about you know. 12 years ago and was built with the idea in mind that we should be able to have horizontally scalable relational databases. Um, and at the time that was sort of a crazy idea, like all most of the databases that were on the planet were just, you, if you want to make them go faster or bigger, you just make the server bigger, right? Like they were vertically scaled and Oracle was sort of the only company with like a really strong horizontally scaled solution. Um, but you had to spend a lot of money with Oracle. So we sort of said, let's make the like commodity version of Oracle. Let's, let's make it really, really good, really horizontally scalable so we can handle huge, huge big data workloads with the relational query model in mind. So ultimately, it's a distributed relational database that's optimized for very large scale transactional and analytical work. That's really cool. Thank you. And 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 sort of this 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 area of you know being able to have it horizontally scalable, I guess, lends also into its flexibility. And uh, from what looking at what the services you provide are, this also sort of leads into extensibility within databases. And I was wondering, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, so single store as a relational database, like um, for for quite a long time, I would say I'm trying to remember when we added sort of the main extensibility features. I want to say it was like six or seven years ago. Um, for quite a long time, we had the ability to extend single store. So you could vote, like, uh, probably many people on this call are familiar with um, SQL, so SQL, which mm -hmm. is like a way of writing, you know, queries. Um, and some people in the call may be aware of things like PL SQL, which is procedural SQL, um, or like, they have a lot, there's a lot of names for it. And each right. database, like whether it's Postgres or SQL Server or Oracle, they all have sort of their own dialect of PL SQL. Uh, but ultimately it's a way, like imagine you have a SQL query, but then you can like wrap it with like if statements and you can like have control flow and for loops that are interfaced, oh. interspersed with your SQL. And so you could basically write like a program that wraps like, you know, you could like, imagine we want to do a simple thing where we say like four row in select star from users, you know, insert into another table, right? That's like right. a procedural thing like that, that you have multiple operations. Before procedural SQL, you would have to do that in your application. Like you would have, let's say your Ruby on Rails app, you would say select star from users, you put that into like an array in Ruby, you'd iterate right. through your array and you do your operation, right? So you're essentially working within the app. PL SQL, the whole premise, which has been around for a really long time since the beginning of databases, was like, let's write like a custom program language that allows you to basically put that multi like that that procedural thing that for user that, and users do this other thing directly into the database and this has been around for a while it's been around for a really long time now here's the downside the downside is that no one wants to learn these languages <laughs> they're, they're like <laughs> they're really really honestly like pretty bad languages from like uh what we're used to as developers like we're used to really nice ide support really like debuggers yeah. the ability to like print it, even print right so like in a in a pl sql thing you know you don't even really have the ability to do like logging like you would in like your application um it's a very right. different programming environment that is quite complex like it's quite difficult to use but this does exist and so single store has always had uh you know for a really long time has had extensibility but because the ux is so bad it's pretty much only used like we only see it heavily being used by massive enterprise customers who mm. are, they're doing such specific things on such large pieces of data that if they don't push down that logic into the database, the, the logic will not run fast enough, right? So they, they basically just are working with such large amounts of data that they cannot actually move the data from the database into their app to do this like right. weird workload. So they're sort of forced to learn and use this sort of awkward extensibility layer 
because because they they like they have no choice. Like the only way you run <laughs> right. this code is in the data. So then what you're offering instead are, are other possibility of, of extensibility for these databases so that you can forego, if I understood correctly, using PL SQL languages. Um, how does that look? Yeah, so I guess what where, where we're going with this conversation is like what is sort of the newest thing that Single Store has, which is yeah. you said, we want the power of extensibility. We want, we want people to, to be able to push down logic into the database because it allows you to write certain algorithms and, and have them execute really, really fast because they're running sort of directly on the data. There's no network data movement that's happening. Um, but we don't want people to have to write in like this weird language with this like weird development model with like without IDE support. Like we want people to bring their own language. Like if you're really good at Go or Rust or Python, like why can't you just write code like that and yeah. then just magically teleport it into the database? And so that's where we come to Wasm or like WebAssembly. Right. So single store now has our extensibility layer, the same one that we've had for like six years, but we basically laid Wasm on top of it. So now you can basically write your code in whatever can compile to Wasm and you can sort of link against the sort of single store layer, which allows you to uh, essentially compile code and then run it inside of the database. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and that's really, that's really cool because I mean, we'll get into it a little bit later, what it is that Wasm offers for making these so compelling. But I'm curious, you see, there are, from what from what we've seen uh, from Single Star, you've got sort of four areas of extensibility that are possible. We got UDFs, TVFs, UDAs, and stored procedures. Now these are, <laughs> this is a lot of jargon. If we're, and I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume that a lot of us are familiar with UDFs or user-defined functions, which seems pretty straightforward for when to want to, uh, interact with a with a database at a transactional level but i'm curious could you tell us about the could you tell us a little bit about about these other ones for example could we start what are what are tvfs <laughs> yeah so as you said they're, they're sort of like four key object types in the like database extensibility world so these are all uh, concepts that have been in databases again since like the dawn of databases um so they're they're not new so you have four types as you said udfs U tvfs udas sort of procedures there's actually a bunch of other types that are like sort of mm. more specialized but those are sort of the four types that we're focusing on for wasm support so uh we'll start with tv or you said tvs right the first that's right first one you want to learn about <laughs> so tvfs are table valued functions um, the general premise of a TVF is it allows you to basically take in, um, imagine that you have, uh, I'm trying to think of a really good example, um, like let's say that you have a bunch of rows in your database and right. each row has a column and in the column there's, um, like imagine that these rows represent shopping lists. So cool. like each row represents like uh, a user shopping list. Like I want to go to the grocery store and buy like all these things. Um, and so in the row, like imagine that in the row, you actually had like a JSON object, which contained like the user's shopping list. So rather than like normalizing it out yeah. into like multiple tables, like you would normally do in like a relational system. Let's say you were doing more of like a Mongo style workload where you have mm -hmm. like the document shopping list. And then in the document is like the actual JSON shopping list. It could be arbitrarily complex shopping list. Um, right. And then you wanted to ask that question. You wanted to basically say, like, figure out the like you all of the unique items in the dairy section in every single user's shopping list. Yeah. So you wanted to do some like operation where you're like looking at only like items that are classified as like dairy items. And you wanted to like find like the unique set of like all the dairy items. You could do this in a number of different ways. But one yeah. way you could do this is a TBF. And a TBF would allow you to take in the shopping list as like input. So like for every shopping list, like one row in, you could basically output a, an individual row for every item that's like a dairy item. So it's essentially we're taking in like one row in and we're producing like N rows out. Right. 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 So it's kind of, I mean, it is, I mean, it's, 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 it's the F of function, right? It's, yep. it's, it's transforming. It's transforming data. Effectively think about it as like a table transform. So I can take in like a yeah. table as input and produce a different shaped table as output. And I could I could change like the number of rows. Like I could say for every row in, I produce like N rows out. Or I could potentially filter. Like you could also do like really custom complex filtering logic where you basically yeah. say like for every row in, I might produce a row out. 
right? So like, then you could have like this really complex relational filter operator. So TVFs allow you to, to, to basically do like almost like a mapping operation, like a or transform operation to a set. Um, and you can be sort of arbitrarily complex transform operation. That's really cool. And, 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 and I suppose what you're doing is then providing customers with a, with an API that they can interact with with these with, be able to write their own TVFs in their yeah. own language. Yeah. So now, for example, like you could take uh, our, you know, like currently like in WebAssembly for the, the canonical ABI, which is like sort of the best ABI that has like the most support. Um, currently like writing in Rust and C++ are sort of the best ways. Like they have the right. best language support, the best library support. It's possible to do it in other languages. You just like are much more on your own about like how easy it is as everyone yeah. in the WebAssembly community is currently aware of. Um, but yeah, so like, <laughs> let's say that you are willing to write Rust and you wanted to write a Rust function that was doing like really complex transformations on the data. Like you could do, you know, you could pull in some like machine learning model, for example, and compile that into your Rust program and do some table transformation that actually like leveraged like a machine learning model, um, which would be basically impossible to do in like normal SQL. Like you, you right. wouldn't be able to do this. You would have to take all the data out of the database, run your transfer, like your machine learning model outside the database, and then you'd like put it back, which would suck. Like you'd move a lot of data around. But in this model, we can keep all the data in the database, run the model directly on the rows, transform the table sort of in place and output a new type of table, whatever that is. Right. And that's where the that's where the that sort of like horizontal scalability that you mentioned earlier becomes so attainable through the power of WebAssembly because what you're doing is essentially running, correct me if I'm wrong, running code directly in the database yep. as opposed to querying the database, doing your thing. So you're sort you're of- You're absolutely right. That's, that's a really insightful point, which is that because we're horizontally scalable, when you say like run my TVF on this table, uh, under the hood, single store is paralyzing that across the entire distributed system and pushing down that logic all the way to where the data is stored on disk. So if you have like a thousand single store nodes, you know, storing an absolutely obscene amount of data, like petabytes of data, okay, that's probably too right. terabytes of data. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, you have like a really large environment. Um, yeah. And you want to do this like TVF transformation. You know, you need to do that as close to the data as possible, and ideally like scaled out, paralyzed as possible, and we do that automatically. That's really cool. Thank you. So. Uh, let's move on to UDAs. I, I don't actually know what these are at all. <laughs> UDAs are another really sort of awkward concept, but like they're actually really easy to explain through a different concept, which is uh, everyone knows like how an average works, right? Sure. I can explain it to make sure everyone knows, but basically like, let's just say like you have the most simple SQL query, actually even better than average. Let's just do count. Count is a really easy one. So if I say like select count star from T, I think everyone gets the idea that like what we're doing is we're basically counting the number of rows in T, right? Yeah. This is in relational algebra, or like relational databases is called an aggregate operation. So we're essentially saying like, essentially imagine that the way this works is that, imagine that like at the fundamental level, a database just says like for each row, like imagine just like a for loop over all the rows in your table. If you say like, like select count star from T, what you're doing is you're saying like for each row, count plus equals one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's all it is. Like the code that you would write in your app would be that if you wanted to do count star, right? It's the same. Um, there's some like technicalities I'm not going to go into, but let's just say that's sure. like the same, right? So, so aggregate operations are really cool because it allows you to basically build up a statistical representation or an accurate representation of your data that like collapses your data into like smaller chunks. So in this case, we're collapsing all of your data down to like a single number. Um, and you can be really compli complicated with aggregates. You could say like select, let's say that country comma count star from T group by country. And now what we're doing is we're saying, give me the number of rows in each country. Right. A little bit more complex of a query, but basically like aggregates are really nice in relational SQL and they compose nicely with like all of the aspects of relational algebra. So where am I going with this? So like an aggregate, Pretty simple concept like count star, really good. Average is a similar concept. Like if you're computing the average of a column, we just basically you know calculate the counts and the sums of all the values and then divide them. Pretty straightforward. Um, UDAs are user-defined aggregates. Yeah. 
they're pieces of code that you write yourself that you can decide what is in that for loop body. Right. What the, what, what comes to mind, please correct me if I'm going off on a wrong tangent here. What, what this reminds me of is sort of a, at least from JavaScript, I know this as a reduce callback. Yeah. It's like a reducer. A reducer. And, that's, and yeah. That's in like JavaScript, like if you're used to like redux in the front end, right? Like uh, if you're used to this sort of reduced pattern for state management, where essentially like your entire front end app is composed into like current state and then like a reduce function, which takes in an action and applies it to the state and returns the new state. Yeah. Is that what you're, you're referring to? I wasn't referring to that with Redux per se, but definitely with say, for example, like when I was thinking what I was, what I had more in mind was for example, taking an array of data sure. yeah. and reducing it to a single piece. Same thing, right? So in the, yeah. in the in that formulation, I think in JavaScript there's two versions of the reduce function. One version just gives the the like uh, the sort of like reduce function. It gives it like the previous answer and then like the yeah. next element, and it just can, keeps like iterating and collapses the array. Um, yeah. And then there's another formulation where you think you can pass in like your own custom starter point, like your own memo value. Got it. And then that will be like the initial version, like the initial sort of state. Yes. And then you can collapse everything into the state. But you're 100% right. A UDA is nothing more than a relational reduce function. So now we have like multiple tools in our toolbox. We have right. our, like, it's actually really cool. So UDF, going back to that really quickly, UDF sure. is your user defined function. This is your simple map operation in JavaScript. You have an array of numbers and you say like array dot map, like, x equals x times 2, right? This is, it's one row in, one row out is UDF. Yeah. Then we have our TDF, which is essentially a transformation. It says one row in and then maybe like 10 rows out or zero rows out or whatever. So this is more like in JavaScript, this would be like a flat map operation. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Right? And then in, in, then you have your UDA and UDA is basically a reduce operation. So now we can say, uh, essentially like a state and a row in and then like a new state out. So we're essentially collapsing rows. So the re output of a re reduce is going to be like a single state object. Whatever that right. object is, it's up to you, but that's a state object. So I love we're this parallel totally... we're drawing. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, this, is really, this is a great way to explain all these extensibility objects because they allow you to extend relational algebra with these like custom pieces of code that you would do in your application. And it allows you to basically push that stuff that you would normally have to do in your application down into the database. And that's like a fundamental sort of paradigm shift. That's really cool. Uh, thank you for, 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 for putting this so, so eloquently. Like, I, I love that, how this is coming together. And I, uh, I'm fascinated because, like, if, <laughs> if I known that these existed when I was learning, you know, relational, uh, relational databases in, in school, um, prior to this interview, we we're talking about like edu tech education and stuff. Like, I would have loved to know this stuff. Cool. So, so again, UDF, TVS, UDAs, all running your code, your language, and these are run against in in your database. Yep. The last one then would be stored procedures. Yep. I'm curious, what 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 can you tell me about those? So, this is the one that that is like the one that doesn't fit perfectly with the other three. Sure. The other three like nicely composed together. So like if you're used to writing yeah. JavaScript or any modern language, they all pretty much have like these functional primitives like map, reduce, flat map, right? They compose nicely. Like you can chain them into each other. You could like map, then you could flat map, then you could reduce. You could do some really cool stuff um, by chaining them together. You can build really complex algorithms, right? So they're really composable. Store procedures are not composable. Store procedures are a completely different concept. Basically, a store procedure is take like your normal app code. Like imagine your normal app code in like Ruby on Rails. So like you have sure. like your user controller and, you know, you have a function that, um, I don't know, I'm going to come up with some like really weird thing. Like let's say you're, it's like a game app or like gamified thing. And like, sure. you know, your user controller has like a method that basically says like we're going to, um, we're going to like look at the user and we're going to check some complex set of criteria. Like we're going to look at a couple different fields on the user. Um, mm -hmm. And if the user matches some criteria, like let's say that they're like in a particular group, 
um, and maybe that they have, uh, they've done something in the application, like they've clicked on some particular button. There's some like set of criteria that is important. And based on that set of criteria, we're going to like increment their score by either one, 10 or a hundred, right? right? So we've built some kind of like game logic that's like trying to increment this user's score based on like some things that they've done that's trying to gamify an application or something like that. That's a pretty yeah. reasonable controller. So in this world, like in this controller world, let's say that we want to apply this method to like all of our users. Now, what we can do is we could basically like with UDFs, with single store UDFs, we could actually like potentially push down that, that individual logic the like per user logic, we could push down into single store. Mm -hmm. um, and we could basically have the like function that says like, if the user did X, Y, and Z, then like either increment their score by like one, 10 or a hundred. But there's still like the piece of logic that's still in Ruby on Rails. that's sort of like for user and users, like increment user sort of thing, right? There's like mm -hmm. still this piece of logic. Um, and this is sort of a bad example, but it's like the quickest example I can come up with, which is that like store procedure allows you to even push that piece of logic down into single store. It allows you to push basically like multiple operations, like control flow operations into the engine and have your sort of like entire controller be represented as like a single function call in single store. Got it. Got it. So uh, let me, let me, let me try and see if I, if I got this correctly and please correct me if I got it wrong. So we've got, so these store procedures are modular pieces of code that we did or modular pieces of functionality that we build in to, for example, increase a user score that we sort of bring together as a single function. I'm that not explaining it. I'm not explaining it well. Let me try a different I'm explanation. Sorry. No, no, it, <laughs> I it, not you. I, as I was explaining, I was like, no, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> um, I think a better example is actually, uh, I think a much more understandable example that's probably something that everyone has done if they're if they've ever written like an application that uses a database is you've probably written a function at some point in your application which does something like begin transaction insert row into table a insert row into table b insert row into table c like do some like stuff to like save some state and then commit right like this is a pretty yeah. common thing right Okay, so that's a much better example. Sort procedure allows you to put that entire transaction and push that into the database. So you can take all of that logic, the like everything between begin transaction and commit, all of those individual insert operations, potentially update operations, potentially select code operations, like all of this database app interaction, you could basically tell it, like take all of that logic, push that into the database. And the database will then expose a single function name called like foo, whatever you want to call it. Sure. And now your app, if whenever it wants to run that transaction, it just calls foo. It just says, call foo. Here's my input arguments. I'm done. And the database will optimize that entire set of operations, that entire transaction, and push that all down to the database. So there's not going to be any round trips between your app and the database anymore. I think it just clicked. So what you're what you're essentially doing is like storing database level functionality and making it something that you can recall at any time without having to jump in and out of the out, out of the database think about it like lambda functions but in yeah. a database. yeah okay that is wicked cool yeah. um i dig it thank you Th and and again because it is built with WebAssembly as well once again something we can write in our own code so yeah so that one, just to like caveat, because this is going to go live in like the next two weeks, that one is coming <laughs> out soon, but not actually out huh. yet. So you cannot today like write a sort procedure in Wasm in single store. You can write like a sort procedure in PL SQL, which is like that weird language that we've had forever. Um, we're right. currently building sort procedures Wasm. That's like a feature that we're going to release this year. And the actual goal is to do sort procedures Wasm with Python. Like that's going to be the Ooh. first thing because we feel that like for low level code, like UDFs, you want that code to run as fast as possible. Like you want that to be like zero latency overhead. If you're going to run a UDF over a billion rows, right? You, you need that to be like microseconds of overhead to make that work. But if you're doing a sort procedure like that much more higher level logic where you're saying like, you know, insert into table A, insert into table B, 
that actual logic, like the high level control flow logic, doesn't actually have to be optimized to run in a microsecond. It needs to be easy to write. It needs to be like fast to write, easy for developers to debug, like all of these things, because it's more like control logic. Um, and Python is more than fast enough to run the control logic. Like that's not going to be the overhead, right? So we're going to start with Python, but it's going to be WebAssembly. It's going to be Python compiled to WebAssembly running your store procedures written in Python. That's fascinating. I love that distinction you make because I, I mean, first of all, it goes into my next question really nicely, but I think making that and, and, and outlining that distinction between say code that we need to be super fast and code that needs to be like easy, easy, easily maintainable, easily readable, understandable. Um, that's, that's really cool. And like making that distinction of where you need it. I think Python is definitely a good fit. I'm more of a Ruby guy myself, but like, I get it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and actually, uh, one of the goals we have with the Python work that we're doing is yeah. we're also thinking about how um, more generally, like high level interpreted runtimes like Ruby, Python, you know, these types of runtimes should exist, like coexist with the, the WASM landscape. And so the yeah. model that we're actually building is actually not Python oriented. It uses yeah. a general purpose runtime extensibility model and a, like a component that represents sort of the logic. Uh, and the cool part is that if we do this right, you should be able to do Ruby sort procedures, Python sort procedures, R sort procedures, like any interpreted language sort procedure, wow. uh, as long as it fits within this like general like runtime component model. And that runtime component model, we're going to be contributing to like the whole WASM community. That's not just for us. That's for, that's basically our idea of, okay, this is how we should make like high level interpreted runtimes really work well within the, like the new WASM registry and component model and, and all this sort of stuff. That's fascinating. Thank you for sharing that. And I love that. That uh, This is what I love about the WASM community in general, that there's, there's this like collaborative, Hey, let's explore these new paradigms um, attitude to it. So let's go, let, let, let's get into that aforementioned uh, question that I was going into. So, I think we've seen a little bit of, of, of this already, but I'd love to give you the opportunity to sort of outline directly. Why is, in your opinion, WASM a good fit for this? So when we were thinking about, um, or I guess I'll go a different angle, which is like a couple of years ago, Single Star started what, what is called the Launchpad team. So it's the team that I run. And the Launchpad team is basically, the idea was look at, the entire database landscape and then look at the rest of the computer science landscape and basically look for opportunities to sort of put those two things together for like a better together sort of outcome. Um, and when we were like looking at the space was when we started seriously doing research into WebAssembly. Um, we had someone uh, join the team um, named Bailey Hayes, uh, who now works at Cosmonic, but is still like a close, close collaborator and good friend. Um, and Bailey and I started to chat a lot about the benefits of WebAssembly and you know how it could be potentially be used within a database. So the main benefit that got us really excited was a, I guess two two benefits. Um, one is that it was a lightweight runtime, like unlike bringing in like the JVM, which is like a very heavy runtime and includes like a lot of mechanics. Um, because of the WASM capability model. You could basically bring in a like almost zero cost runtime, like not quite zero cost, but very close to zero cost runtime that only supports like capabilities ABC that are all like really cheap capabilities to support. And, and then we could basically automatically support WebAssembly models that just depend on those particular capabilities. And so the, the WASM architecture of being capability first, which also lends to the second main point, which is that it's sandboxed by default. Right. Because of this capability model, you can basically decide how heavyweight your runtime is going to be. And that's really important for a database where in certain cases, like in a UDF, a UDF in single store cannot go and like operate network sockets. It cannot go and run file system operations. It can't allocate more than like a very small amount of fixed memory. And these are things that we need to guarantee to fit within like our processing model. Um, because when you're running a query over a billion rows and you want that to actually execute today and not like in 10 years, you actually have to make very, very concrete guarantees about like the runtime behavior of that thing. And WebAssembly allowed us to do that, but being able to do it with the advantage that people can bring their own code. So like before with before WebAssembly, the only way we could do this was basically writing our own programming language. 
which is PL SQL. And right. PL SQL has the same thing. PL SQL is extremely restricted. You can only do, it's a capability model. You can only do what we, we allow you to do. And that allows us to make guarantees about its execution. But yeah. downside is now you have to write, you know, write your code in PL SQL, which no one wants to do. That's <laughs> yeah. a new language that's like not, it doesn't have all the nice things. So Wasm was sort of best of both worlds. It gives us the runtime guarantees of the capability model, performance, security, sandboxing, with all those things combined with the bring your own code model for really good developer experience. That's really cool. And, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to uh, shout out, if I may, uh, I have Carl's permission, uh, a talk that he gave at uh, Wasm Day North America uh, last year. Was it, it was October, right? End of October, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. Um, where he talks about, you know, how you all use how how to scale your architecture with the power of of WebAssembly and this extensibility also gives a really cool demo. We're gonna link that in this in this in the description of this meetup and uh, video. So please go check it out. It's it's particularly cool and it's 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 a demo that really is worth seeing. Like I I, I really enjoyed it and it really helped me understand all of this much better. Thanks. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> it was fun. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And and like. What I learned through both this video and from talking to you is, is, I mean, you know, I've 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 looked at databases and 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 you know, I've, you know, I I started out in Ruby on Rails myself, but after uh, starting out before that as a Mac OS developer, and and this this, I'd honestly never paid much mind to uh, transactions beyond the Rails level, which was you know having these. Oh no, the word escaped me. Uh... Not transactions. You get active record stuff, or yeah, when you when you define a state of the database and then you move to the next state of the database through these, they're called. I am so sorry. Uh, you're talking about um, uh, something points. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, they're migrations. Like state... Sorry. Oh, migrations. Yeah, that's different. Okay. Yeah, migrations. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. And if I remember correctly, I could be wrong. These these migrations are in of themselves a transaction as well as the transactions you do when you insert or modify data on a database. Uh, yeah, most of the time, yeah. <laughs> some, some migrations <laughs> are not transactional, but um, but yes, in, sure. general, in general, you're absolutely right. Like transactions are a major piece of every database. Like most people, yeah. um, you know, who are building like what we call like uh, a OLTP application, an online transactional processing application, depend right. on the concept of transactions and specifically online transactions. The ability to effectively change the state of the database in an atomic way while someone else is reading the database. It's a really yeah. hard problem. So like the bank transaction is like the classic, right? It's like I need to, if I, like, let's say that I want to send you $50, I need yeah. to like atomically reduce my bank account balance by $50 and I need to increment your bank balance by $50 if you go with like the sort of stateful bank model. Um, and if you want to do that, well, at the exact same time, someone's like running select star from balances. Yeah. You need to make sure that they don't see like an intermediate state where I've lost my $50, but you haven't gained your $50 because now we've like, we've lost money temporarily, right? And then some other downstream thing might be broken because it might expect that like all the balances should add up to zero, right? Yeah. So transactions are really, really important. Um, and just like to touch on that with WebAssembly, because we've put your logic into the database, you can now have complex business logic run completely transactionally, where you can have like a complex, like multi-step operation um, that, that does a lot of interesting work at like the data level. And you can run that within a transaction um, and it can sort of be arbitrarily complex code. Uh, and that's really cool. So like before yeah. you would have to use your application, you'd have to say begin transaction and do a bunch of round trips to the database to accomplish this. And now with WebAssembly, you could take that exact same code. Hopefully we support, you know, every language in the world soon. Like that's the goal of WebAssembly. Um, right. Eventually you'll be able to take exactly that code and just teleport in the database. It will run safer because it's, it's, it's still in a transaction, but it's like running directly within our transactional layer. But more importantly is it will run faster because it will run without overhead. There's no more round trips outside of the database. It's entirely encapsulated. And we can even do really interesting optimizations within the transaction that you can't do without knowing more information about the actual transaction. So um, yeah, long story short, WebAssembly plus transactions 
is really exciting. It's like custom user-defined code that's transactional. Love it. Thank you so much. Well, listen, I know, I, I know I've had you for a while and I really appreciate you taking the time. I'd love to ask you a couple more questions if I may. Uh, one of them is what, I mean, you've shared with us a little bit of what's going on with, with WebAssembly and single source. I was wondering, could you share, uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with us about where all of this is headed for all of you? Um, I guess the, the things that I'm most excited about in like the WebAssembly community more broadly and the things yeah. that single source is also really excited about because it will just improve what we're doing and also hopefully will improve everything in the WASM community uh, is the WASM registry, which is a, a thing that single source is con contributing to uh, something awesome. that one of my team members, Kyle Brown is working on is, uh, is basically improving the WASM registry or building the WASM registry actually. Uh, and that will allow us to have sort of a centralized um, way to sort of share components um, and be able to share interfaces and share worlds in the new component architecture. There's like a lot of really advanced uh, concepts there that I'm really excited about. Um, similarly and like related is the component model. So the component model is still getting sort of yeah. finalized, but it's every day is like getting more and more exciting for the potential of the component model. And I'm not going to go into the, like what that is in this talk. That's, that's like a, you do, we'll link some other things. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll put some links. There's actually a, a Wasm Day North America talk that's really good about that too. Oh, right. Yeah. So that's really good. And then I guess the last two that I'm really excited about is like Wasm Async, um, you know, getting like first class asynchronous support to like improve the sort of interop between the WebAssembly model and the host runtime will be really powerful and also will improve like intercomponent um, communication and like some really, I think some of the biggest performance holes in WebAssembly right now will be potentially solvable with the async support, which is going to be really cool. Uh, and then GC, like WASM GC, a first class sort of garbage collection within mm. WebAssembly runtime will hopefully allow um, other languages to be ported to WASM sort of more nicely, like more natively, instead of running GC inside of the WASM runtime. Like there right. will be hopefully something better. I'm not sure as much about that one, like how that's going to land, but it is an exciting idea. That's really cool, and you know, you know what I find fascinating through, by by listening to to you talk about that is that because WebAssembly in of itself is this implementation detail that we bring into our our work, it's it, it, into our work, say for us at Suborbital, for you at at uh, Single Store, is that we all kind of we all benefit from it, and and this work is is remarkable. So, like you know, thank you to all of you for doing your part in making that more approachable more making that future more easily attainable and it's just it's just it's so it's so cool that you all have this 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 sort of objective right this this sort of like objective that we all kind of share of you know making WebAssembly a more awesome place to be yeah. and a more awesome runtime for all of us yeah i totally agree with that sentiment like uh the wasm community is a super collaborative community i've been very impressed yeah. by how close it is um, and how collaborative everyone is. And I'm just really excited to see um, that continue. And if single store can be part of that and help the community just evolve, then that's, that's better for everyone. Wonderful. Well, Carl, this has been absolutely wonderful. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to, to do this with me. I'd love to give you the opportunity. Uh, if people want to get in touch with you and talk to you about WASM stuff, where can they get in touch with you? Twitter, Mastodon, uh, I think Remon will, will link my handles. Um, definitely ping me there. And I don't, uh, anyways, yeah, those are probably the, the two easiest ways to get a hold of me. <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, listen, thank you so much. Uh, and to the rest of everyone listening, wish you the best for the rest of this day and a wonderful rest of the meetup. Thanks again. Thanks. See ya. Uh, awesome. We are very happy that Carl was able to do this interview, and we're extra happy that he now gets to join us live uh, to answer some questions, of which we have quite a few. So I'm going to bring Carl in to the stream so we can chat. Hey, Carl. Hey, Connor. Hey, everyone. How's it going? Not too bad. My lighting is terrible compared to your lighting. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get like, some better direct light. <laughs> it's really dark yeah. here, so... Yeah, pretty. I mean, pretty move the table so that I have the right overhead lighting. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Well, it's like it's like we jump forward in time because it's you in the same place but wearing a different uh, different shirt, so we can 
do a bit of time travel. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, uh, we got a number of questions to go through. Let's let's jump right into it. Um, starting with, if you are allowing Wasm to run within a database, how is that different from a blockchain-based solution that has embedded Wasm runtime architecture-wise? So this is a, a really good question because I, I think it highlights um, the fact that effectively blockchains are databases. Um, so there actually isn't a lot of difference in terms of the actual execution model. So like whether it's in single store transaction or a blockchain transaction, it's still basically loading a Wasm module, uh, running, you know, running the module with some input, getting output, and then committing that as like part of transaction. Um, I would say one major difference is maybe like use case. Like, so most blockchain uh, blockchains or like Wasm running inside blockchains are really focused on manipulating the state of the blockchain, right? So they're much more like, you know, given some input transaction, like how do we manipulate the state of the blockchain to like produce a new state of the blockchain? Um, but with single store with Wasm, you can also use Wasm to just augment read queries. So you're not actually doing a write operation to the database. You're essentially, you know, running custom logic um, to transform the result in some interesting way. Awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, that's one thing that I think a lot of people don't necessarily realize because blockchains are so tightly coupled with the, with the currencies that are built on top of them. It's really just a really widely distributed way of storing some data and having everybody agree on what that data is. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Um, so there's another question about uh, whether TBFs would be uh, good for ETL scenarios and maybe uh, we can expand those acronyms. Um, ETL is uh, extend transfer or no. Extract. What does the E stand for? Extract, transform, and load. That's it. Um, and so, yeah, would, would TBFs be useful in those kinds of scenarios? Yeah. So, so first I'll just clarify. So it's TVF. So it's tra trans mm -hmm. uh, sorry, table valued function. Um, right. So if you think about a, a function, um, like a, a function, you know, a t, t table value function effectively takes in like the whole table as an input. Um, or like a range of rows within the system. We don't really think about it as like a table, but you know, you take in some number of rows as input and you produce some number of rows as output. That's sort of what a TVF is, is uh, within the system. Um, and an ETL are, is essentially extract, transform, load. So the idea is you have extract, which is like, go grab data from Kafka, go grab data from S3, go grab data from some other system. Transform is manipulate the data in some way to like, match wherever you're storing the data and then load would be like storing the data. So long story short, absolutely tr uh, TVFs could be used for ETLs. Um, however, all of our WASM functions are actually really useful for um, for doing ETL operations. You have to do like, sometimes you have to do custom aggregates. Sometimes you have to do larger, more customized sort of manipulation of data. Sometimes you have to fork data into multiple places. So you have to sort of use all the different primitives to actually implement uh, sophisticated ETL workloads. Yeah, absolutely. There's 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 nothing like a you know arbit the the power of arbitrary logic to make ETLs easier in lots of different ways. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And then I guess similarly, uh, would a UDA be a map reduce? I think we covered that. Uh, I think UDA would be um, definitely the reduce part of MapReduce, uh, UDAs work within like the group by logic of a distributed database or a database. So there's there's like a separate mapping architecture that you can hook into with UDFs. Um, and you can also hook into mapping with like TBFs. Uh, so yeah, long story short, there's not, not like a direct correlation. It's just like all of these primitives can collectively implement MapReduce architectures. Awesome, great. Um, so I think we want to know a bit about performance. Have you, or has single store perhaps done any benchmarks on using store procedures versus UDFs or UDAs? So we've done some basic benchmarking. So, so just as a general note, so single store doesn't have laws and store procedures yet. So that, that's like right. the next thing that we're going to do right now. We just have like UDFs, UDAs and TDFs, uh, which are like all like sort of data level operations in WASM. In terms of overhead, we've done a little bit of benchmarking um, with specifically with UDFs, because that's like the most mature thing that we have in terms of like, it's the simplest thing. So it's the easiest thing to sort of get it really, really high performance. Um, and right now for like a completely no-op UDF, like, you know, send an integer basically into Wasm, get it out, 
um, but you basically don't do anything. It's it's like one to two microseconds of overhead, which is really, really little. <laughs> um, yeah. It gets like way higher overhead if you start passing in like large amounts of data, if you start doing right. stuff inside Wasm, you obviously have the regular like Wasm time overhead, but um, the actual like sort of baseline overhead, we've reduced as much as possible. Right. I think that's something um, that a lot of people don't know about WebAssembly is that you have to copy stuff into the sandbox most of the time. You can't just allow it to arbitrarily read data outside that sandbox because that would defeat a lot of the purposes of that sandbox itself. And so um, when you're working with really, really large chunks of data, um, it can have a performance hit. But if you're dealing with tons of small pieces of data, it maybe has a, a bit of better performance. Exactly. Yeah, and also like, um, I'm sure that suborbital is the same thing. Like when you're doing this all the time, you're able to amortize a lot of the costs out uh, right. from the individual calls by doing things up front, by like saving state, saving memory. Like there's lots of really cool stuff you can do with Wasm. Absolutely, great. Um, so follow up to that, if you can do a rough UDF, why would you reach for a stored procedure instead? Uh, honestly, I, I would, I, I basically switched over to using Rust as like my predominant choice for writing any kind of like in database procedure stuff. Um, the only time where maybe it's like not as nice is where you want to just run a query. So if, imagine if you right. have like a sort procedure, which just runs like select star from foo, like, and then maybe inserts it into another table or something. There's not a lot of custom Rust logic you need, but it's really ergonomic to be able to literally just type your select query and like encode it as a sort procedure. So there's sure. still a use case for sort of SQL sort procedures, but I would say the if you're doing anything complicated, it's nicer to do it in Rust awesome. or in any other language, basically. Nice. Uh, we're going to jump around a little bit. Um, and uh, Flocky wants to know what WebAssembly engine does single story use? Uh, we use Wasm time. Awesome. And does the Wasm execution model make it possible to build, maybe in the future, a database specific engine with extra optimizations? So that's actually a really cool question. So, single store, um, like a lot of databases, has some unique low level concepts that would potentially allow us to build something more optimized than Wasm time, like more deeply integrated. Um, and the main thing is that single store is a, like a code gen database. So we actually take like your SQL query, we compile it to like a bytecode, which then ends up being compiled to LLV LLVM bytecode and then gets compiled to like machine code. And there's like a lot of compilation that happens within the system when you actually run a query. The advantage is that actually uh, LLVM, you can also compile like Wasm to LLVM bytecode. Um, and so we actually lo are looking at options of basically pre-compiling the Wasm directly and like directly into the actual query bytecode. Um, right. and eliminating a lot of sort of the overhead because queries themselves are already heavily sandboxed within our execution engine. So yeah. you, we can sort of eliminate some of this sort of security stuff within the Wasm layer um, to be able to improve performance and be able to have like shared memory and stuff like that, which would be massive performance upgrade. That's pretty cool. Uh, and relatedly, uh, there's a question here. Uh, where did it go? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, are any of the internals of single store built on Rust? And would you be able to perhaps have some, um, I guess this is myself extending the question, like uh, would you be able to share data types and like do some more efficient memory passing by having Rust passing data into Rust Wasm modules, kind of stuff like that? Um, so in terms of the, the, the main question, which is like, are, are, do we use Rust? We don't, we're all C++. Um, however, we have a pretty, sort of Rust compatible sort of type system and memory model. So a lot of the things like the ways we store data in the engine is sort of the same ways like Rust rep, Rust, like uh, looks at the data, uh, stores the stores data. So there is a lot of opportunity to like eliminate um, sort of serialization, deserialization overhead when moving data back and forth. Yeah, awesome. Um, and you've already answered the, uh, the first part of this question about uh, which engine did you choose, but uh, was there any particular reason why Wasm time was chosen and were there any trade-offs considered? Yeah, so we actually, at the very beginning, we were playing around with pretty much all the engines. Um, I don't remember exactly the order, but we definitely played with like Wasm 3. We played with uh, Wasmer probably, Wasm time, like basically anything that was like available, we just looked at. Um, we ended up like sort of landing on Wasm time because we decided pretty early on that we wanted to like focus on the sort of component model and the interface type specification and sort of like some of the newer like bytecode alliance 
specs. Um, and because of that, we just wanted to stick with laws of time, which was always like the bleeding edge of, of support for all those types of specs. Um, so yeah, we're not like particularly locked into any particular engine. Uh, our code is somewhat portable. Like we could probably switch to another engine, but um, at, at least at this point, we're pretty dedicated to laws of time. Cool. Um, and so uh, if you do have mostly C++ internal components, were there any major hurdles to doing foreign function interfaces between that and the WebAssembly CMOS? So not, not really, I wouldn't say like hurdles, but we did end up doing some pretty deep integration work. So um, if any, I'll just give a like brief overview. So th there's a concept called like interface types, which is basically like canonical uh, way of passing like complex data types back and forth between like the host and the guest, right? So if you have a simple data type, like an int 32, you just can pass it using like the regular base laws and type system. It's all easy. Mm -hmm. But if you want to pass something like a string or, or even something more complex, like a nested structure, um, you have to go through some kind of like codec basically. Um, and so interface type spec, spec uh, includes its own like canonical ABI codec, which is like a binary codec that has a lot of really nice properties. So all of that to say, the major hurdle that we had was integrating that sort of codec deeply into our code execution, like our code gen system. So if I, I said earlier that basically single store compiles queries, which means that at the time of compilation, we actually know every type. We know exactly like that this, this column has like this specific type and it's like flowing into the data, you know, the query at this point. We know pretty much everything very, very statically. And so what we can actually do is we can compile basically inline machine code that that runs like basically executes the canonical ABI specifically for the particular query you're executing. So we, we're able to like eliminate a very large amount of overhead. Um, so there's essentially no runtime reflection in the entire stack. Like everything happens at compilation time. So when you run the query, uh, the data is, is it, I mean, the code that's executing is, is literally just like inline machine code. Um, that's being compiled for your particular machine and particular architecture. Um, so yeah, long story short, we built most of that from scratch inside of our engine from the ground up. Yeah, that's pretty cool. There's, it's amazing the, the different kinds of optimizations and the different kinds of superpowers that WebAssembly gives you because of the portability and it's wonderful. Um, cool, so breezing through these, um, what are some of the complexities involved in implementing store procedures with WASM and why do they come last? I'm assuming he means of the four major yeah. types. Yeah. Uh, also, hey, Steve. <laughs> nice, nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, we um, all know Steve. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah. So, um, super good question. So, complexities involved in implementing sort procedures. So, the main complexity is that sort procedures involve involve like a two way conversation between the host and the guest. So, like a UDF, right? Is is basically like I call the UDF. I pass in all the data the UDF needs, like just like the input, the function arguments. The UDF does some work, and then it returns some out. Some output. It's, it's like a, a pure function in some wor worlds. Um, but uh, procedures are different. Like I call into the procedure and the procedure might call back to the database, say like run this query or do this thing. And then it expects to like regain control, like almost like a coroutine, uh, do some more stuff. And then again, call back to the, the host. Um, and this pattern, uh, there, there's no current standardized version of this pattern in the WASM world. There, there's right. many alternative versions, like different sort of competing versions for this pattern, but there's none that's we like, have our own. <laughs> this is the way he does things. So suborbital has theirs. Uh, you know, I was just reading about, um, I think it's WAPC. Yeah, yeah. WAPC has like their own version of this yeah. and, and so on. Um, so we're, we're essentially having, we'll have to, having to build our own, at least as like, as like the first pass, uh, but our eventual goal is to like, be able to do this via the async proposal in the yeah. wild and time and like by code alliance so uh, long story short it's that's really why we've waited so long because we wanted to give the system the ecosystem as much time as possible to sort of converge on some main ideas uh, around it awesome yeah I, I remember in the very very early days of suborbital that was one of the very first things that i had to solve was how can i have bi-directional and you know somewhat efficient communication between the guests and the host and having multiple um, calls out to the host taking place during a call into the guest. It was, yeah. it, it took me maybe three months to like fully wrap my head around how all of that would work 
how to implement it in more than one language because I, I would implement it in Rust and then it <laughs> slightly wouldn't work for Go and I would have to go back and change everything. It took quite a while to get that working. That was one of the first things that I you know had to really get working well uh, in order to convince myself that WebAssembly was going to be the right tool for what yeah. we were trying to do. Welcome to co-routines. <laughs> like, That's right. Effectively, or like async, or like there's, there's so many names for this, but yeah, it's a common technology that uh, is annoying to build. <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. All right, I'm just going through the rest of the comments. Everybody is very thankful that we've been able to do this. I think it was a really good look into the possibilities of WebAssembly. And, you know, you know that uh, Suborbital is also very passionate about using WebAssembly to enable accessibility. And so I'm really glad uh, personally that we got to do this. Um, we had a question about uh, how many people are on the Launchpad team. Uh, team. So in total, there are six people. Let's see, wait, it always is complex. Uh, yeah, basically six people. But in terms of like actually the number of people who worked on the Wasm project, it was basically like one and a half mm -hmm. to two, cool. depending on who, like depending on what time it was. But yeah, it, it's not like really like uh, a lot of the power of Wasm and Single Store was driven by the fact that Single Store already existed and has a lot of its right. own power. Um, and really to add Wasm was, was a lot of work, but it was, you know, it was, uh, able to be done by like a couple of people really, really focused for a couple of months. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's a testament to how far the WebAssembly tooling and, and all of the work done on the Wasm Time project, like it's, it means that you can enable safe, untrusted third party code execution with one person over the course of a few months. Whereas a couple of years ago, that would have taken, you know, 10 people a year. Yeah. Now for what it's worth, the, the person who worked on this, is, is like an insanely good programmer. <laughs> so it's like, I, I wouldn't say like the average programmer could, could do it. I, I'm really, really impressed by um, Pete who did like a huge amount of work on this project along with other people on the team. But but really, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty fantastic. Yeah, well, hopefully we can get to the point where it's, you know, completely accessible and uh, it becomes just a no brainer to use exactly. in a few years. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then we have a question about the Wasm register. I think that. maybe the registry, is that what yeah, you're referring I think, to? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so um, so the Wasm registry is, is a project that's actively being worked on by the Bytecode Alliance. It's not the only registry out there. There's, there's various different uh, folks uh, um, working on different kinds of registries. Uh, ultimately, you know, like within the Wasm ecosystem, you always have the question of, at some point, we want to be able to have Wasm modules depend on other Wasm modules. Um, we want code to be able to depend on WASM modules. We want to be able to do this in like a somewhat abstract way. And so we're going to need things like registries or package registries or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thanks for the clarification. Um, so long story short, yes, like uh, there is a really cool like registry project that one of the, my teammates, uh, Kyle, is working on in the Bytecode Alliance. If you go to like their GitHub, pretty sure it's open source. Um, they also have like a SIG registry meeting group if you want to participate and like be part of the design. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just really excited about it. Like I, I think I see a future where, you know, you could theoretically have like just normal libraries distributed as WASM modules. And like if you're if it was deeply integrated into your language runtime, uh, you might not even have to know, you know, like imagine you just like cargo install something and under the hood, it's not actually you're not actually getting rest. You're just getting some like WASM module that just exports an API and, and that's it. That's right. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I'm, I've been waiting for the day where, you know, big popular languages like FFmpeg or Libstodium or whatever, they're just yes. WebAssembly modules and it doesn't matter what language they came from. You could be, you could be importing a Python, you know, piece of code into your Rust application or Go or whatever. And it, it actually, just, it should uh, I was just, let me just find this because I was just looking at it today. Um, so like some, some people might know this, there's a thing called apexlang.io. I'm not sure how to put it in chat, but, uh, I don't know. Come you can send it to me. Me. You yeah. can send it to me. In, in yeah, I send it to you on Discord. Um, okay. anyways, there's a thing called Apex Lang and, uh, I, I only want to bring it up because I noticed that their main distribution mechanism is a WASM module. So like literally like when you go to say like install Apex Lang, it gives you a WASM, like literal WASM module. And they're like, here's the exported API. Have fun. Uh, wow. 
which is the first time I've actually seen it. Now it's obviously like a Wasm project, which, you know, obviously they're like deeply bought into the Wasm ecosystem, but right. um, it's a great example of what the future could potentially look like. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, and uh, on the registry topic, uh, I believe it was just a few weeks ago that Docker updated the main like Docker Hub registry to support the um, any MIME type. And so you can now actually package WebAssembly modules using the OCI image specification and push them to Docker Hub. And so there's going to be probably a couple of different ways to implement a registry and uh, consume a registry, but um, the Bytecode Alliance is, is working on something that is native to the idea of WebAssembly modules and the concept of worlds and all of the different component model um, concepts. And so I'll be very excited to see what comes of that. Over and one more I've been note, to a couple of meetings. It's, yeah, it's, one uh, more note on the, on the registry thing is that it's explicitly being designed to sit on top of things like OCI. So right. you, you can actually have like, you can publish your package to OCI using, you know, Docker Hub or whatever you want, but then you can essentially register the package in the package registry. So it acts like a, a universal sort of uh, access mechanism and sort of API to Waza modules, no matter where, where they are. So I'm hoping that we actually end up with like a very, very healthy ecosystem of registries as opposed to just being like npm.js.org you know, or whatever. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think uh, I'm just going through one more time. I think that's all the questions. Thank you, everybody who put in questions. You have one last chance to... Uh, put a question in chat and we might be able to grab it just at the last second, but I think that is the end. Um, thank you again, Carl, for both uh, spending some time with Ramon to record the interview and then also for joining us tonight live uh, to answer the questions that came up from the interview. Um, we will be back in a couple of weeks with another uh, iteration of WebAssembly North America. Uh, if there's anything that you want to see in the meetup, if there's any topic or project or person that you want us to have on uh, to interview, then uh, you can send a tweet to wasm underscore NA. Uh, you can find me on various socials. I'm Kohik almost everywhere. Um, or find some other way to get in touch with us and uh, give us your feedback. Um, thank you again, Carl. And it uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I think we'll call it there. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, thanks, Connor. And thanks everyone for listening. Please, please reach out on Twitter if you want to follow up on any of the things we talked about today. Yeah. Carl is a great person to chat with. Uh, I, can, I can tell you from experience. So definitely take him up on that. Thanks, Connor. All right. All right. Have a good one. Have a good Cheers. evening, everyone, or, or wherever you are in the world. Cheers. Bye. Bye.